Be my theme, blessed Redeemer, this is my constant longing and prayer. Glory our forfeit, all of our treasures, Jesus, I perfect longing to wear. Church at Make Sure at Malden. We're glad each one of you are here with us today. We've got just a few announcements before we begin our worship service. I hope each one of you picked up a bulletin and we're going to go all, over all the things in the bulletin. Uh, let's remember our shut ins that's in our bulletin, our sick. We're going to add a few to our sick list. Uh, let's, uh, Dennis said Ruth Reynolds called this morning. She, her and Deborah's not feeling well. So and Rick's also with them. Let's remember them also. Uh, Team Westmoreland, <clears throat> where she had COVID, and she's going to be going to our rehab center. I don't know if she's went there yet, so let's remember her. And also Peggy <laughs> Westmoreland, she had COVID, so let's remember them. Also this morning, Joe and David's not feeling well, so they're not with us. And also uh, Susanna called uh, <coughs> Sue Deal's nieces. And she's already had her surgery this morning because she, she did a fracture her hip. And she's already had surgery, and they said everything went well in surgery this morning. So let's keep Sue Deals in our prayers. Also, uh, Susan Luttrell, let's remember her. And uh, she this was told earlier, she wanted everyone to know, thank everyone for the prayers, cards, and calls. We've got a card here from it. it says thank you it says dear church your generosity and caring love reveal the love of god beyond what can be told every expression shows that your respect you respect this his command to love thy neighbor as i said what better comfort is is there than to be surrounded by such good christians and every one of you are in our prayers of gratitude and please know that we will do what we can when you are in need. And it says in Christian fellowship and love, it's Paul and, Su Paul and Susan Luttrell. And I'll hang this on the <coughs> board. Uh, also, uh, personal work group meeting will be this after, after evening services tonight. And also the men's business meeting will be after evening services tonight. So all men, if you can, please come and stay for that. Into our worship this morning, our song leader will be Joel Foster. Our scripture read Ray Moore. Our lesson by Dennis Strine. Closing prayer by Joel Maddox. And we'll begin our worship service with opening prayer. And that will be with Joel Foster. Bow with me, please. Father in heaven, we're so grateful for this time that we can assemble and be with you. And be with one another. We pray that you'd bless each person that's here this morning, that we will do things that are in accordance to your word, 
and we will show love one for another. That we will be obedient to your commands. Father, we are mindful of those that Brother Dale has mentioned that are sick, those that are recovering, especially for Sister Teen, Sister Sue, and others that have been mentioned, Sister Ruth and her family. Pray that you be with them, comfort them, heal them as only you have the power. Father, we are grateful for each one that is part of this congregation. We pray that we will stand up and be beacons for your truth here in the community, that others will see what we have and will desire to be a part of what we have. Our Father in heaven, we especially are grateful for our leaders, for our first responders, that you would protect them, keep them out of harm's way, for our military that are both in this country and abroad, that you would protect them as well. We pray for our leaders that you will defeat them in those things that Satan would have them to do, that they will follow after your word, return many of the things that we're seeing that are so wrong today, Father, that they will understand the error of their desires and their ways and will correct it. So, Father, as we've said before, if we are compelled to obey man in a way that's contrary to your word, that we will stand up, as Peter said, we will obey God, we must obey God rather than man, and we will obey you in your word. We pray now, Father, that you be with us in this worship service, we will go to Dennis as he presents our message to us. We pray that you join us as we sing, and we teach one another, as we commune through the Lord's Supper. We pray for your blessings. In all things, Father, your will be done for us in the name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Good morning. I'm going to ask for a favor this morning. I'm still recovering from this mess. You can probably hear it in my voice. If I go into a coughing fit, ignore me and just keep singing. Uh, you may have to do that a couple of times. So appreciate it very much. Five, six, nine. Five, six, nine. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
565. This song will be used to prepare our minds for taking the Lord's Supper. 565. continue to get our minds on Jesus and him crucified on this day of the soon. Let's remember Jesus and everything that he has done for us making this true that we can all be in heaven one day and we'll be obedient. 
I'm going to be reading the first Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us continue to remember Jesus as he died on the cross for us. Let us give thanks for the body. Heavenly Father, we're so thankful, forever thankful for sending your son to the cross as he suffered and bled and died so we may have the opportunity of everlasting life. As we now prepare to partake of this bread, we know it represents his body that hung there on the cross. May we partake in a manner that you find pleasing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our thought was still on Jesus, and they crucified in our stand, but let's give thanks for the blood. Our kind heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to take this the food of life, which represents the shared blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May we as Christians partake of this in a manner pleasing enough to be. In Christ's name we pray.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. We now have the opportunity to give back in the, for all the blessings that God has given to us. And uh, be reading from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I decided, they directed the churches of Galatia. So you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper, so that there will be no collecting when I come. Well, not only that we're to give to uh, give to uh, money for money from us to keep the church building might go to go on, but uh, we're, we're to do everything we can each and every day of our life and trying to do good for everybody that we can. So I'm going to be reading the uh, Second Corinthians chapter nine and verses uh, six through seven. This point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows beautiful, bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray now as we give thanks for our blessings. Our precious Heavenly Father, we come unto thee with thankful hearts. Thank thee for this opportunity to be here at this your, your hut, your house today. We pray, Father, and are thankful for the ways and means that we have to earn our living. And we pray, Father, that as we give back, that we do it with a, with a cheerful heart. And we pray that you will forgive us of our sin as we come through this service. Five, four, zero. Five, four, zero. <clears throat> Pardon will 
more like you. More like you. Someone in time of need. 
Believe it or not, we do not have to rely on anyone or anything for our well-being. For the way we live, for how we enjoy life. Blaming others, blaming situations and circumstances is the devil's way of keeping us from living the Christian life that we should. There is a story about a prominent social club who had selected a skid row bum that they thought they could help become successful in life. So they took this man and they put him up in a luxury hotel. They put him in a very expensive room. They got him cleaned up and bought him an expensive suit. He was given an office. He was made a legitimate vice president with responsibilities that this man could handle. Everything looked good. The man seemed to fit in well. But three days later, he didn't show up for work. So they checked his room and he wasn't there. They had checked down at the restaurant, but he hadn't eaten there either. A few days later, they found him back on Skid Row, living in and eating out of a garbage bin. So what happened? Just this. For any meaningful change to take place in our lives, it must have its beginnings on the inside, our hearts. Spiritually speaking, we can be here three times a week. We can participate in all the tenets of our worship. And yet we could still be living in a spiritual skid row. That spiritual poverty, unless and until we decide to be more Christ-like, nothing will happen in the way of genuine character improvement. When Joshua challenged Israel, Joshua said, decide today whom you will serve. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2, Paul said basically the same thing. He said, today is the day of salvation. Now is the accepted time. In our reading that Ray gave us, 
The Hebrew writer tells us in those verses that genuine religion is a heart issue. In verses 22 and 23 of Hebrews chapter 10, he writes here, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil, evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without waiting. For he who promised is faithful. You know that little organ that sits in the center of our chest is an engineering marvel. You know for my years in the fire department we thought that a pump that could pump 1200, 2000 gallons a minute was something special. But it was massive. The largest pump as far as the fire service goes, was in New York City. They called it a super pumper. It could pump 10,000 gallons of water a minute. And yet it cannot compare to that little pump that sits in the center of our chest. It beats over 100,000 times a day. Every four minutes, it completely pumps our full blood supply through that heart. In scripture, the physical heart is often used as a metaphor of our spiritual being. You see, the heart of the Bible is more than a blood pump. It is the mind. It is the very seat of our emotions. It is who we are. But when God looks at us, he doesn't see what we see in one another. He sees the real us. And this is exactly what we find in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. When Samuel was given the chore of finding a replacement for Saul. God told him man looks on the outward appearance but God sees the heart. <coughs> So what does the Bible say about the heart and the potential that it has for making a difference in the way we live? <coughs> Solomon writes in Proverbs 23 and verse 7, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What we think controls who and what we are. <coughs> Thinking evil, ugly thoughts makes us ugly indeed. Thinking good, godly thoughts makes us more like Christ. There's no wonder that Paul wrote in Philippians 4 and verse 18, whatever is true, honorable, just, Poor, pure, lovely, commendable. If there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Friends, we become what we think. <coughs> Proverbs 4, verse 23, Solomon said, Out of the heart come the issues of life. You see, real life isn't made up of material things. It's made up of heart issues. This is close to what Paul is saying in 2 Corinthians 4, 18. Do not fix your eyes on what is seen, but what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So the question is, what is our life made up of? What is our focus? What truly goes on in our hearts? Are we concerned with what we see? Or are we more concerned with the unseen? 
we concerned with the material or are we concerned with the issues of the heart the things like hope faith love joy patience peace Proverbs 6 and verse 18 tells us that evil imaginations come from the heart. So what do we imagine? What do we fantasize about? What are our dreams? This is why Jesus in Matthew 5 he said and I'm, I'm didn't give you the verses for these, but you'll get my meaning here. He said, you've heard it said, you do not commit adultery, do not murder. But I tell you, he that looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her already in his heart. He that is angry with his brother is a murderer already and in danger of judgment. This is what we need to think about. The Bible teaches that what we imagine, we become. What we think, we are. Sin or righteousness has its beginnings within our imagination. Jesus, Matthew 15 and verse 8. Jesus said, These people draw near to me with their lips. They honor me with their lips. But their hearts are far from me. Hope we can see what Jesus is telling us. That we can live an outwardly good life. But inwardly, our hearts are far from God. In Mark chapter 7, verses 21 to 23, Jesus said from within, out of men's hearts come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, gossip, arrogance, and folly. All these evils come from inside and make a man unclean. So in short, what we think will make us either clean or unclean. Doubts that we may have a weak faith as its beginnings in our own thoughts. James 1 verse 14 tells us that we are lured, that we are enticed by our desires. In Psalms 101 in verse 5, it says there that God will exclude from his presence two groups. Two groups. Those who slander the brethren and those who have a proud heart. Solomon reminds us that pride is God's number one hated sin. If our faith is weak, it will allow the idols of this world to take control. If we had to list our idols, what would we list? Friends, whether we choose to accept it or not, we are the keepers of our own hearts. I can't keep your heart. You can't keep mine. 
we decide for ourselves what to allow in our hearts, what we think about, what attitudes and dispositions we exhibit and hold. Only us within ourselves can control our hearts. God will not take control of it. Satan will expose it, exploit it, but he can't even control it. In Psalms 44 and verses 20 and 21, David writes, If we had forgotten the name of our God or spread out our hands to a foreign God, would not God discover this? For he knows the secrets of the heart. Mind reading is a scary thing to contemplate. Husbands, would you be afraid of your wife if you knew she could read your mind? <laughs> would you not make a concerted effort to change your mind so that all that she would see was love and kindness and respect? Friends, wives can't do that. Though sometimes we think they can. Friends, know this. God can. And if we have this secret fear that our wives know our minds, shouldn't we have that awesome fear that God does know ours? I want to close this part of a lesson by saying that God does open hearts. In Acts chapter 16, we find a woman by the name of Lydia, a seller of purple. Verse 14 tells us that God opened her heart. She accepted the gospel. She, along with her family, were baptized. He opened her heart in a way that she had Paul and them stay and leave with her while they were there. You see, God opens our hearts anytime and all the time when we will listen to the truth. If we allow God to open our hearts. This is why we need to spend more time in fellowship. We need to spend more time with our eyes and noses in our Bibles. In a meaningful study, not just to read it. That we need to spend more and more time in private, in prayer, in conversation with God. problem comes when we decide on our own that we know all the truth that we need to know or when we decide that we will not obey the truth that we do know. Just what kind of heart should we have? First, we need a heart that is focused on God. When Jesus was asked what was the first commandment, Jesus replied to that question, love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. And maybe by knowing this, we can understand a little bit of why I so often quote Matthew 6, verse 33. 
to remind ourselves that we need to seek God, His righteousness, in order to have the eternal life that is promised to us. You see, seeking God and His righteousness is the heart of, of eternal life. Secondly, we must have a heart that is concerned about others. Do we love others as much as we love ourselves? We don't often realize that when we help others, we are actually serving Christ. Maybe we should spend a little more time in trying to find different ways of helping, of letting our talents flourish instead of what we're going to do tomorrow or the next day or the next month or the next year. Putting our thoughts in these things we will do well in putting the right things in our hearts. You know, the churches of Galatia, they were struggling. They had some very troubling heart issues, and Paul spent his time trying to correct those things. He gave them a lot of different commands to follow. He wanted their hearts to get back to where it should be. So in Galatians 6 and verse 10, he said, Then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to them of the household of faith. Jesus tells us that we're to love our enemies. But why? Why does God command us to love those who hate us? Well, we have... The answer in Luke chapter 6. In verse 35. It says love your enemies. Do good to them. And lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. You will be sons of the most high. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. You caught those two things, right? The things that we gain. Great rewards. Becoming sons of God. Is that the kind of incentive that we're willing to accept? But you see, it's a choice that can only be made by ourselves. Thirdly, we must be pure in our motives. Matthew 5 and verse 8 in the Beatitudes, Jesus said, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure hearts are blessed with the sense of God's presence. God wants us to have a heart that is focused on Him. A heart that is sensitive to the needs of others. But more importantly, a heart that operates out of a pure motive. A pure heart is the one that does things that pleases God without ulterior motive. A good example of this would be an individual who has a desire to become an elder. And that desire is because they love the people around them so much they want to help them get to heaven. Compared to that person who desires an eldership so he can have the power. Friends, if we really want to be more Christ-like, the way truly is simple. Be willing to have his heart Think like he thought. Change our attitudes 
and dispositions to be more in line with his and be willing to obey God in our daily behavior. Life is about the choices. And the choices we make establishes who we are. If you are not a child of God this morning, you have a choice. Today is the day of salvation. Today is a day that can change your life forever. It will give you the ability to have the eternal life that God has promised. Through that repentance, that confession, having your sins washed away in New Testament baptism, you can become that child of God. And then begin that step and live to the best of your abilities that Christian life that God wants us to live. An eternal life is assured. Maybe you are a child of God. Maybe you've drifted away. Maybe you've made choices in your life. Maybe your disposition, maybe your attitudes needs to be changed. And you realize that. And you need to make things right. If there's anyone that's in need of the invitation, won't you come together? We stand and we sing. <coughs> Oh, so I stay away from Jesus' stone way to
Rachel and Marty have come forward this morning asking for our prayers. Rachel, wants to be the example for her family that she needs to be. And she admitted she's not been that example. It allows the different things to get to her in a way that is unchristian-like. The difficulties that she faces, the uncertainty of the future. She fears for Gabby because Gabby will be starting high school and uh, high school is a scary place today. The things that happened around our nation, as any parent, calls for worry. She's concerned about her parents. She loves them. She loves her family. She loves God and his son. So we need to pray that she will be forgiven of these things that she's readily admitted to. Barney has come forward and things have not been going well for Barney. Seems as if it's just snowball effect one thing after another till it's spinning out of control and causes him to doubt his faith. Some of us may have been there at one time or another. Facing one adversity after another kind of makes us wonder where God is at. And why isn't he helping? But he's still there. He's still helping. If we're still alive and still bearing up under it, then God is with us because he's not giving us more than we can. Be. We're a lot stronger than we think we are. God would not allow that much pressure on us. Will you bow with me, please, as we go to God in prayer on behalf of Gabby and Mark? Our Father in heaven, we are, we are so thankful for these two souls that have come forward this morning. Life is difficult. We all understand that. There is not a day that goes by that something that causes us to stomp our toes. As much as we try, we often fail. We do not spend enough time with you in prayer to help us sometimes, Lord, to be able to resist the things that are before us. We become more attuned to speaking before we hear. We think less and less and speak more and more. And therefore, Lord, at times our mouth gets away from us. We pray fervently, Lord, for Rachel and Barney, for the things that they are going through, we ask you, Lord, for some relief. Allow the good to outshine the bad. Relieve them of the anxiety of the future and grab hold and just grasp the present of this moment in time, knowing that you are there in the future already. You know what lies ahead. We pray, Lord, that we give that to you and just guide our steps into the future. We pray that you'll forgive them of the sins that they've committed. the lapse of faith, maybe, and strengthen them. We continue to watch over them. Bless them as only you can, not just them, but also their family, that they can continue, Lord, to be good and faithful servants of you. We pray that you will continue to bless them and all of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Nothing further will stand, will be dismissed with prayer. Father, kind Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for all the many blessings that you have given us. We're thankful 
that we could come here this morning to sing songs of praises unto thee, to hear a portion of thy word spoken unto thee. We pray that we will take the things we have heard here this morning and apply them to our lives. We pray that you would be with our shut ins, the ones that are sick. We pray that you would be with Kenny and Cadence as they're going through COVID. We're so thankful for Barney and Rachel coming forward this morning. We pray that you would comfort them, that we may all be able to strengthen them, and in turn that they may strengthen us. We pray that you would be with each and every one of us here this morning because we all fall short. We're so thankful for the avenue of prayer that we have to ask for forgiveness. We pray that you would always watch over us, that you would guide, guard, and direct us through our lives, and forgive us of our sins. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.